welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. All right, I'm going to get down on my knees. I need God a whole lot now. You need God too. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. It's good to come into the house of the Lord and have some fun. You know, the Spirit of the Lord is in this place, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness, Lord. But I love that joy part, Father. We ought to be the most joyful people on the planet. We have Jesus. We've read the end of the book. We win. The eastern sky is going to split, and we're getting out of here someday. One way or the other, we're getting out of here. And we thank you, Lord, that we can call ourselves Christians tonight because of the blood of the Lord that cross that you went to and rose from the dead on the third day and tomb is empty. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the praise, give you the glory. We thank you, Father. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, short man, white man, black man. We haven't come to hear from a brown man. We haven't come to hear from, you know, whatever. We've come to hear from the Holy Spirit who's the teacher of the church. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all of the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. Now, Lord, as you're going to bless us tonight, as you're going to bless us, we know you are because you're here. We want you to bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ all over the planet as well as the Inland Empire. Bless them too, Lord. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels in Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters, Adventist brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for Trinity and Emmanuel and Ecclesia and the Way and San Bernardino Temple. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. No, no. We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. God will give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. With a great big shout, we say amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and take your seats. We'd like to welcome all of you that are online. I don't know how many of you are online or where you're at. We know there's about 44 to 40. 849 countries in the planet right now that are watching at this very, very moment. And I don't know if you've ever been online, but it's almost like you're here. Um, it's, it's really kind of a cool thing. So we love you guys. Thanks for being with us. You're going to enjoy tonight's service. You're going to enjoy the Word of the Lord. Let's talk about the Word of God before we go to the Word of God tonight. For those of you that are new, we always, in these church services, Always find out what the Bible has to say. Here, you know, bottom line, can I be frank with you? Really don't give flip about what you have to say. And I don't really give a flip about what I have to say. In fact, quite frankly, don't care what men have to say. I want to find out what God has to say. God knows what's going on. I mean, if you want a hamburger, go to McDonald's. But don't go to a pizza parlor to get a hamburger. Go someplace that makes hamburgers. You know what I'm saying? If you want to find out about the wisdom on how to live life, go to God. He created life. And that's what we do every time we go to the Word of God. We find out how to do life. You Now, here's the deal. You think you know how to do life. You do life according to your mom and your dad. You do life according to your education or what influenced you as a child. You do life according to what society or social systems dictate to you. You and I do life according to the economy, you know, what our economics say we can do, what we can't do. Let me tell you something, how to really do life is to find out what the Bible, B-I-B-L-E says, and then apply it in your life. And when you do, God is there, he'll confirm what it is that you're doing and start to bless you. If you find yourself making decisions in life, you'll end up based on your own intellect, your own ideologies and philosophies, making these decisions will oftentimes take you to the wrong places. The wrong places end up cursed or unblessed in such a way that you complain and grumble at God and are frustrated with God. Tonight, as we go to the word of the Lord, the word of God talks about everything. 
I don't care where you're at, who you are. If you come into the house of God and you've got answers, you listen, God will give you some of the answers. How to live, how to raise your family, how to bless your children, how to be prosperous economically. It's all through the scripture. How to get God to back you, how to get answered to prayers, how to have a great marriage, how to have a great uh, relationship with relatives or friends or boss or employees, employer relationships, whatever it is that you're at. The answers to life are found in the Word of God. And I'm grateful that I belong to a church that we always go to the Word of God and find out some basic, simple principles that we can easily understand and learn and apply in our life so that we can be blessed. Because the bottom line, don't kid yourself and don't mess with me. You want to be blessed or you wouldn't be here. And you want to know what the Word of God has to say, not a man, or you wouldn't be here. Because the Rock Church World Outreach Center says it like it is about the Bible. Now, sometimes that's going to rub you the wrong way because you're going to find out there's a lot of things that God says in Scripture that are contrary to your feelings. A lot of times God will say something in Scripture that's contrary to your wants. Sometimes God will say something in Scripture contrary to my or your ideologies or my ideologies or philosophy on how life ought to be done. And that's where you're come to make the choice. You're going to follow God by faith in God because you trust him. Or are you going to just do it to what you think and end up wherever you end up and then blame God because you don't follow the rules? It's like following a map on a vacation. I don't know what it is about men. Men don't like to look at maps. Oftentimes we find ourselves, well, why don't you just stop, Debbie will say to me, Ask the gas station person, or let's get a map, or uh, GPS, or whatever, you know. You just stop and let me plug in the GPS. Now nah, I know where I'm going, you know. And we end up messing up everything, getting there a half an hour late. And I'm admitting that in front of Debbie, that is hard for me to do. <laughs> Yet at the same time, that's what we basically are all like. We want to do it our way. We want to do our thinking. We want anybody to know. And here's the Bible coming along. God says, here's a manual on how to live life. If you don't know it, you're going to live it your way instead of my way. And that's what we're learning how to do is live it his way. A couple of weeks back, I taught on a Wednesday night, part number one on why people miss opportunities. This is part number two tonight. Part number one, why people miss opportunities, is really kind of neat, and I'll tell you about it in just a moment. But all of us, every day, if you're born of the Spirit of God, God will present to you throughout the entire day opportunities that if you take them, you're going to get blessed. Let me say that again. God will present to you throughout the day opportunities that if you take them, you're going to get blessed. If you ignore them, then you're on your own because you made your own choice. And a lot of times we don't realize opportunities can go just anywhere, go to the very maximum to our businesses, uh, right on down to family relationships, right on down to peace of the heart, can make health choices, all kinds of opportunities that God presents us with. If we'll just go down that particular path or that road, that opportunity, take it, we'll end up blessed. If we don't take it, we end up you know, discouraged and frustrated, ended up at the end of your life saying, God, I wish I did, and I could have and I should have, but I didn't. And that's missed opportunities. And all of us are going to, from time to time, miss opportunities. But Deborah and I, over the years, as older people, have found ourselves doing some things. When we make choices and decisions in life, we ask, what's the reason we're making the choice? Is the choice we're making or the reasoning we're coming to the gathering of the data that we have and the decision we're making, was it based on what the Word of God has said for us about that or is it based on what we feel? And we literally stop before we take opportunities and we consider things and consider where our thoughts and our feelings are coming from so that we don't miss godly opportunities. And for all of us in here, this is a learning process. You're learning how to not miss godly opportunities. And you do it by checking yourself from time to time, slowing down in these simple processes that you'll see in Scripture we're going to go to tonight. Some more simple processes, but the first three that I gave you in part number one. 
is why people miss opportunities is number one, if you'll remember, was half-hearted response. They really aren't passionately into something. Can I tell you something right now? If you're not passionately into something, God won't get passionately into it either. God will be as passionate about something, I found that out in scripture, as you are about something. And if you're not passionate about it, he won't be passionate about it either. That's why the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And oftentimes we're half-hearted in our approach to the thing. We want it, but we won't want it too much. We want it, but we want to get out of sync with what we think. We want it, but we want it our way or the, on our timing and our existence. And we're really half-hearted in the approach. And we find out, God, I don't understand why you're not in this. Can I say it again? If you're not wholehearted in it, don't expect God to be wholehearted. Stupid to expect God to be wholehearted in something we're half-hearted about. So the number one thing we saw, we saw the scripture on that last time we were together. Number two, we found out why people miss opportunities was because of improper discernment of time. You know, we think we've got enough time or we think time's up or we're too late or we're too early. Time is so important for all of us. What is the timing? Have you ever had somebody, if you asked them about how successful, why were you successful? Well, I happen to be in the right time and the right place. Have you ever, anybody heard that besides me? Can I tell you something? When you're in the right timing in the right place, whew, that's God's timing and God's place, you get blessed. And we have our improper discernment of time. So we evaluate time like too late, not too much. I don't have enough time. I can't make it work. I'm too old. I'm too young. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't have enough experience. All of which comes back to the word time. Time is so important for us. And opportunities come as God opens doors, not based on your ability, but based on his ability. So timing is based on his approach. Third thing we found out about is why people miss opportunities, if you'll remember, were foolish assumptions. I'm assuming something that's totally foolish, and you'd find out if it's foolish or not by checking it out if it would be in the Word of God or not in the Word of God. You know, I'm foolishly assuming that's the way the person is. I'm foolishly assuming that's the way it's going to be forever. I'm foolishly assuming this is what's going to happen or not happen. I'm foolishly assuming. We foolishly assume things every day of our life. And in missing opportunities because we foolishly assume something and it's not the way it is. When we could easily find out the way it is and trust the Lord to make it come to pass. So we oftentimes find ourselves foolishly assuming things and they're not the things we ought to be assuming. Which brings us to number four on why people miss opportunities. Tonight, if it's with your permission, four, five, six, and seven, we'll conclude with that. Is that all right? Four quick things tonight on why people miss opportunities. Number four, fear of failure. You know, the bottom line for every one of us, including Pastor Jim and especially Pastor Deborah, Fear of failure is there for all of us. We're afraid to fail. In fact, oftentimes when Deb and I are making a business decision, we choose not to do something, we will look back at what is the world is the root of our decision. Was it fear? Because if it's fear, you know, fear can be good. It can also be bad. But if it's fear of something like failure, then all of a sudden that's got to send a signal out to you that this is the wrong thing. And you can't make a decision based on fear of some form of failure because I want to ask you a question. How do you fail when you're in God who picks you up and puts you back on the road? Wait a minute. The Bible says in Romans the 8th chapter, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. You know what that is? That is a safe, that's a, uh, an absolutely net, a safety net under your, that's a promise from God, a safety net that means you can't fall nor can you fail. You may mess up, but he'll pick you up and take the mess and make it something wonderful. All things work together for the good of them <clears throat> that love the Lord called called his purpose. What has fear got to do with it? And we always get into a place where, man, I'm afraid to fail. Well, I tell you what, I much rather, and that took me a lot of years to get there, and I don't expect you to be there right now, but listen to this. I much rather fear, uh, I much rather fail uh, trying than to fear and never try. 
Because I know that if I fail trying, God will pick me up and put me right back on the road. I'm like a guy that's going to fall off a four-story building and land on his feet. Not because I'm talented, but because he's wonderful. His name is Jesus. Are you following me? My trust is in my future for Jesus. It's not me that's so wonderful, but he is wonderful. He is powerful. He is mighty. He can open doors no man can open. He can close doors no man can close. Come on, his name is Jesus. What is there to fear when he's on your side? I have yet to ever meet, in all the years I've been a Christian preaching the gospel for 40 years, I have yet to ever meet uh, somebody that got slapped around from God because he made a mistake and failed. Never. I have never found that. And yet we fear things on a constant basis. We're a fear of results. And when in fact there's nothing to fear when God's on your side. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I know God's on your side? If you're born of the Spirit of God, he's on your side. Even if, he's, even if you're not born of the Spirit of God, he's on your side. He still loves you. It doesn't mean he's going to support you. Because You need to get right with God, and we'll take care of that later on. But here's the point. Fear of failure is amazing. Let me tell you a little story. You know it already. Most of you, Matthew 25th chapter, Jesus speaking. <clears throat> Go there with me in your Bible also. Make some notes in your Bible. It's really kind of cool. Matthew 25, starting verse number 14. I'm going to read this. As I go to Matthew 25, starting verse number 14, I'm going to read it and explain it to you. Is that okay? So that you can understand this. Remember, keep in mind that our subject is fear of failure. Why people miss opportunities? Because they're afraid of failure. And deep down inside, that's something nobody really admits. Most people don't even recognize it. you got to stop and consider where you're at and why you're making decisions in order to even recognize it. In other words, you'll think, well, I'm not doing this because of fear. And yet, at the same time, deep down inside, it's the fear that stops you. And until you recognize that by stopping, slowing down life and considering where you're making decisions from, then you find yourself in that kind of a place. Now, listen closely. Now, what takes place? Verse number 14, the 25th chapter of Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, here's this illustration. Here's a man that's traveling in a far country. The man, obviously, is God, calls his servants, and he gives his servants uh, his, his material things. And he says to these servants, verse number 15, let's take a look at it. And to one he gave five talents, and to another he gave two, and to another one, and each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on his journey. So all of a sudden he comes along and he gives them the talents they need. Let's just consider it. Let me bring it up to your attention. Let me point out, all three people got something. Debbie and I have always thought of ourselves as one-talent people. So if you think of yourself as a one-talent person, welcome, I am too. I'm a one-talent person, but I'm not going to do something with my one talent, which is nothing because of fear. Now watch this. So he comes along, he gives one guy five talents. Everybody say five. five. Another guy gives two. Everybody say two. two. Another guy gives one. one. Everybody say one. one. Okay, now he gave it to him according to their ability. In other words, the guy that had five talents, he was obviously a guy that had a lot of ability. The guy that had two talents didn't have as much ability. The guy that had one talent had... Now God gives them something. Now watch this. Now, you'll find out as you keep reading, and I'm not going to read it to you, that he takes a guy with five talents. What's he do with them? He, he, he takes the five talents, and he multiplies them. He has ten talents. The guy with two talents, he sees what the guy at five talents has done. He goes and does likewise, the Bible says. And he takes his two talents. Now he has four talents. But the guy with one talent takes his one talent and buries it in the ground so that when the master, or in this particular case, the word is actually described as Lord, L-O-R-D. When the Lord returns, he asks everybody for an accountability of what you did with what God gave you or what the master gave you. The five talent guy says, man, I made you five more. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You've been rule over small things, so I'll make you rule over a lot of things if you read that. And he comes to the two-talent guy, and the two-talent guy says, hey, look, I did the same thing. I went from two-talent to four-talent. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, come on in to the house of the Lord and to the joy of the Lord, and you've been master over little things. I'll make you master over greater things. 
And all of a sudden, they're kind of like rewarded and someone's patting them on the back. All because of the opportunity they had, they took the opportunity. Now watch this. The third guy who got one talent makes a statement. The statement that he makes, he says, listen, I know who you are. You are a hard master. You sow, you reap where you have not sown and you, uh, uh, and you gather where you have not uh, scattered seed. And the master doesn't say, you know, you just call me a bad name. I'm mad at you for calling me a bad name, calling me hard, calling me a master who, who, who reaps where I hasn't sown and, 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 and gathers where I haven't scattered seed. He doesn't. The master agrees, you know how I am. You know, God, when he gives us something, listen to what I'm going to say to you right now. You've got to know that whatever God gives you, God can take it and make it work in your life. He's a God that doesn't work in the physics of this world, but works in the physics of heaven. And the physics of heaven are a whole lot different than the physics of this world. So he becomes a God who gathers where he hasn't scattered and a God who reaps where he hasn't sown. He's a God who can take nothing, make something out of it, and that's the one who gives you the opportunity. But if you take the opportunity and bury it in the ground because you're afraid. Now listen to what he says. May I point it out to you? Verse number 24. When he had received the one talent, came and he said, Lord, I know that you're a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathered where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. Or it's subject to fear of failure. I was afraid and went and hid your talents in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and you gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited the money in the bank and, and at my coming you would have received something back uh, with interest. So all of a sudden here we find that fear will keep a lot of people from doing what they ought to be doing. But why, my question to you is this, what is there to fear if your God controls the circumstances? What is there to fear when the outcome, uh, oh, hear me, are, are you listening? Do I have to run down the aisle and slap you in the face? Listen to what I'm saying to you right now, listen. What is there to fear if your God is the God who makes nothing and takes makes something out of it. If your God cannot, you cannot fail because he cannot fail. And other for you to lose, people would have to go through God to get to you. What is there to fear? And for some of you that wondered why I said that, I'd run down the aisle and slap you in the face because I had to get some of your attention. What is there to fear? What in the world is there to fear? If your God is all that he says he is and the tomb is really empty, then there's nothing to fear because even when you fail, he'll make you successful. Because he's a God that so reaps where he hasn't sown and gathers where he hasn't scattered seed. Are you following me? Got your attention too. Sorry I had to be so blunt with you. But all of your heads went. I'm looking, I'm looking. We're talking about why people miss opportunities. Number one, or number four, fear of failure. Number five. This is a good one. Are you ready? Selfish heart. God blesses those that are generous to other people. God does not bless people who hoard up for themselves because they're afraid of tomorrow. God will meet every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And if he can take care of today, he will be the God who takes care of tomorrow unless you're hoarding up for today. 
And God's always looking for a generous, unselfish heart. Matthew, the 25th chapter, while you're there, this time flip it over to verse number 32. And all of the nations, verse number 32, 25th chapter of Matthew, will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as the sheep divided his sheep from the goats. Don't you know Jesus is gonna divide the sheep from the goats? I'd like to ask you, what's the difference between a sheep and a goat? Sheep follow the shepherd. Goats go around butting things all the time. But, but, uh, but, 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 you know, but. <laughs> and the difference between sheep and goats is that you do not want to be a goat. You want to be a sheep. And he is going to, there's a day coming when he's going to separate them. That's what he said, verse 32. Now watch what he says. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those who are on his right hand. Now here's the difference. One on his right hand are the sheep. Remember that? So here's the king going to say something to them. So what he's going to say to them is going to reflect exactly who they are and what they've done. He says, these, it to, he says, and the king will say to those on his right hand, come in, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger and you took me in and I was naked and you clothed me. And I was sick and you visited me and I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did you see you, we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? They don't even know they did it. They don't even know they did it. It was just part of them to have an unselfish heart that takes care of other people. Can you imagine a church if we all had hearts that said, hey, others are more important. We'll take care of them. I just heard about our prison ministry. Pastor Joel Alvarado, Pastor Joel, stand up. Pastor Joel's over our prison ministry and he was telling me today that um, they have in our... You don't even know you're doing this, but you might as well know it. Did you know that in our uh, juvenile hall, they have dinner in a couple of weeks for 500, is that right? 500 juvenile hall offenders, some are 17 years old, that have life imprisonment. The Rock's putting that on, paying for it. Did you know that 10,000 cards were given out to people in prisons at women's prisons, men's prisons, not just juvenile hall. 10,000 cards were given out free. They don't have any money to buy cards. These were Easter cards and Christmas cards so they could go out and, and do that. How many gifts are given out to, for the prisoners? 1,500 gifts for people in prison. You say, wait a minute, when did I do that, God? Here's how. When I brought my tithe and offering into the house of God, they do something. And, Hey, listen, God, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to give. You're just an idiot if you don't. Why? Because you can't outgive God. Can I just tell you the truth? You know, I mean, the bottom line is time to grow up and realize that God's not looking for somebody who's hoarding. He's looking for somebody who will take care of somebody else above themselves. Man, and when that happens... Woo, I'm telling you, you don't miss opportunities. And a lot of times people, God gives us opportunities to bless other people. We don't take them and we miss the blessings ourselves. I told Deborah the other day when I was faced with a situation, I much rather give than argue with myself and justify why not to give. Are you following me? I much rather give it and let it go than to argue with myself and justify why I shouldn't be given to that person. Just give it. Right hand. Blessed. Is everybody listening? Yeah. We're talking about why people miss opportunities. Here's the a, here's a number six. Are you ready? Why people miss opportunities. Number six, lazy lifestyles. We can get so 
gosh, us humans are mess, you know that? We like going to bed at a certain time. We like eating at a certain time. We don't want to be bothered. We got lifestyles that are set a certain way. I, I'm not getting up before this. I'm not going to sleep before this hour. This is the way it is. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way it looks. Have you ever noticed old men? Old men always wear the same clothes <laughs> because they're so into their lazy lifestyle. My dad had one sweater, beige pair of pants and shoes. I, they were kind of like my shoes, only beige. May I say this to you? If I have these same shoes on a year from now, I give you permission to come up and slap me. <laughs> we, have a, we get in our little ruts, our little routines. We wear, men, ladies, am I telling you the truth? Has, has there has been any change inside the closet on their side? They'd wear the same thing over and over again for the rest of their life. <laughs> Is that not true? Debbie says, you need new shirts. I say, why? I've only had that one for five years. When, and then we had a picture up here on the overhead when we first opened up the building. She said to me the other day, she said, oh my God, you had that same shirt in your closet. <laughs> we get in these ruts, do we not? And we do the same thing over and over. Man, it's a, we eat at a certain time. We brush our teeth at a certain time. We, we do that. I mean, we just get, let me tell you something about missing opportunities. If you don't get out of your ruts, you will miss opportunities because your ruts become something that never allows you to break out and get to where you need to be. So you've always got to expand the rut and get new avenues to go new places. Because if you stay in the same place, then God's got to bless you in that same place doing the same thing all the time. Let me show you something with his disciples. Kind of an interesting little story. We're talking about lazy lifestyles. You're in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Go to Matthew, 26th chapter. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He wants them to simply pray with them. He comes up to them in verse number 40. In fact, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really kind of interesting. Verse number 40. And when he came to his disciples, after he's asked them to pray... He comes back to them. He finds them sleeping and says to Peter, what, could you not watch with me for one hour? And then verse number 41, listen to what it says. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know what he just said? You're in a rut. You're used to falling asleep that time of night. You're asleep instead of praying. In order for them to get to where they need to be and do what they needed to do, they need to get out of the routine and get into God's ways. We don't want to leave our routines. We don't want to leave our ruts. You know why? Because our ruts and our routines are comfortable. But can I tell you something? When God wants to take you to an opportunity, oftentimes where God takes you is not comfortable. But if you're still in the same rut you were in before, you're going to sleep every night at the same night. Have you ever stayed up an extra hour and prayed? Have you ever stayed up and got up in the middle of the night and prayed? Have you ever done something different? So, listen, to get different results in your future, you're going to have to do something different. You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Someone said that once. He wasn't a very smart person. His name was Einstein. <laughs> None of you knew that until I said that. San Bernardino, God. <laughs> Lazy lifestyles, we're all there. What we want to do is tuck in and get comfortable. We, now watch this. We want God to take us to the blessings, but we don't want God to disturb us on the way. Come on. Am I saying anything that anybody can relate to? I'm saying it to myself. God, I want you to bless me, but could you do it after six in the morning when I'm up? Don't speak to me at night. I don't want to talk to you at two. Has anybody ever had the Holy Spirit come to them at two o'clock in the morning and say, could you get up, I want to talk to you? I'm the one that says no. <laughs> Missed opportunity. See, we want the opportunity, but we don't want to be disturbed in our ruts. 
And in order to get you to the opportunity, you're going to have to disturb. Could you not just pray with me one extra hour? So he leaves him, comes back, it's the same story again. They fell asleep again. They missed God completely because they were so set in their ways. They were tired. What do you do when you're tired? Go to sleep. Perfect example of getting into a rut doing things. God, I want you to do it, but don't disturb me in doing it. Come on, all of us. Opportunities we're talking about. Opportunities will make you so uncomfortable, you won't want to take them. Man, I'm at my age starting a business again. With everything I own, every dollar I can scrape up to put it in. At my age. Well, if you fail, what are you going to do? I ain't failing. In fact, that's what the devil says to me. And if you just thought that, the devil just spoke through you. I'm not failing. It's that simple. God's going to back me. I've waited a lifetime to do what I'm going to do. Am I fearful? Not a bit. But I'll tell you what, it's going to take me out of my comfort zone for sure. Because at my age, I just like to sit down, go to sleep, wake up, look at mama, and remember the days when, and go back to sleep. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Somebody over 55 say amen. <laughs> we better move on before I get slapped around when I get home. We're talking about why people miss opportunities, number seven. First one, fear, fear of failure. Second one, selfish heart. Third one, I love it, lazy lifestyles. Fourth one, oh, this is the best of them all, not recognizing Jesus. Listen, when you recognize his presence in something, you have just won the battle. And we don't look for his presence. We don't look for what he's doing. We miss him oftentimes in our life. If it doesn't set up a certain way, if it doesn't feel a certain way, if it doesn't look a certain way, if it doesn't have you know, bells and whistles and candles and smoke and incense, I guess there's no God in it. Miss God completely. When God is right there, when God is right there, you've got to catch him. And we miss him all the time, not recognizing him. Last verse in Luke 19, chapter, I'll just pop it up in verse number 40. Let me just put it up on the overhead. But he answered and said to them, that all his disciples, by the way, Luke 19, chapter, let me give you the story. His, his, these Pharisees are coming to his disciples to say, listen, you need to control and rebuke your disciples. They're crying out, Jesus and doing all that stuff. And the Pharisees are like, like, shut those guys up. And Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he makes a statement, verse number 40. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if those, if these keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Watch verse 40, 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over. The city was Jerusalem. He's crying over it. If you keep reading the verses, you'll find it's because right there was everything they were looking for and they missed Jesus. Right there outside of the city was the peace they wanted, was the joy they desired, was the abundance that was waiting for them, was a life of blessings that was... They've wanted since childhood. Everything they've ever wanted, everything they've ever desired was just outside the city getting ready to ride in on a donkey. And Jerusalem missed the Messiah. And how easy it would be for all of us to simply miss 
God on our everyday adventure in life and miss the opportunities. He's present, but we don't see him. And Deborah and I make a decision about something, being older as we have and serving the Lord all these years. First thing we look for is God in this. If God's in it, then I can make a decision for it. If God's not in it, then I won't make a decision for it. But I've got to find Jesus in everything in order for it to work. And so many times we'll miss God completely. He'd be right in our homes telling us what to do and we miss it. He'd be right there when you're correcting your children and know what to do, but you don't. Right there when a relative or a friend is asking you something and you don't know what to say so you don't say anything. Opportunities that we miss. Business opportunities. Marriage opportunities. Raising children opportunities. If we'll just look for Jesus and not miss him like the entire city of Jerusalem where he got before them and wept because they missed him. It will change the world that we live in. Tonight, four little simple principles, but let's go back to number one on why people miss opportunities. Number one, half-hearted response. Number two, improper discernment of time. Number three, foolish assumptions. Number four, fear of failure. Number five, selfish heart. Number six, lazy lifestyle. Number seven, not recognizing Jesus in his presence in your house that's given you the opportunity to follow him. If God spoke to you tonight, you got to give him a great big praise the Lord. Will you do that? Is God good? Could I just talk to you just for a moment? I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave, and then I'll dismiss you. Nothing could be worse than you coming to the house of God, listening to the word, and you were great listening to the word of the Lord. Coming to the house of God, singing songs, clapping our hands, you were great worshiping the Lord tonight. And then walk out of this place and not be right with God. Die and go to hell. Oh yeah, hell's a real place. The Bible says it is. Jesus talked about it. So because you don't think it is doesn't make it go away. It's just a real place. And I don't want you to die and open your eyes in hell. I want you to go to heaven. And I don't want one person in this place tonight not to go to heaven. So I want you to listen because the Bible says from time to time it's good for you to check yourself out. So let's check ourselves out to make sure we're okay with God. You don't get to go to heaven because you're a nice person. That's what people think. Well, I'm pretty good. I'm a nice person. I'll go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're nice. Did you know it's not in the Bible? It's nowhere in there. Some of you think you're going to go to heaven because you love God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God you get to go to heaven? Nowhere. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you think, well, I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I... I was a Christian. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the scripture, nowhere, it's not in the Bible, you're not going to make it. To say your mom and dad could tell you a Christian, take you to those classes, put religious jewelry on your body, have you christened or baptized as a baby, get you to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. If you think that's going to get you in heaven, you're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you think you're going to go to heaven because, you know, you joined some church somewhere along the line. Might have been a Christian church, sang in the choir. Maybe you helped the pastor, carried his Bible, preached Sunday school, did all kinds of those great things. You're a tither. Guess what? You can be a tither, give all your money. You can go through seminary. You can be the smartest person, quote the scripture, and die and go to hell. Because the only way to get to heaven is God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. 
You can't get there your way. You can't get to heaven my way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. He says these words, you must be born again. John 3rd chapter. He says it to a guy that's a whole lot better in his lifestyle than probably any of us in here. This guy Nicodemus that he says that to was a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture, quoted the scripture, debated the scripture. Listen to this. Sang the scripture as the head of his church, the synagogue, fed the poor, wore ecclesiastical church uh, uh, outfits, uh, uh, costumes, ecclesiastical appearance, and did everything just right. I would have thought that Jesus would have come to him and patted him on the back and said, you know what, Nicodemus, good job, man. You're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you, but he doesn't. He comes to Nicodemus as good as he was, the things that he knew, the things that he did, and he says this to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Bottom line, I know the first thing when I use those words, born again, a lot of people turn their brain off. Hollywood has trained you. How sad is that? To think of born again people as idiots and fools, radicals and fanaticals. And that's not what a born again person is at all. A born again person is simply this. And I'll tell you what it is from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. All are nothing. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down because we're afraid of the people's faces. God forgive us in American churches. It's all or nothing and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of that. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? Here's what he just really said with that crude, rude statement. He just really said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, tell me if this fits. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something, along with everything else. You know, you're not, you're not against God. Watch this, here's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. See, I already know you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. In a few weeks, we're gonna celebrate his birth called Christmas. That's not when he was born, but we celebrate it anyway. Just to let everybody know that he was born for a reason, to celebrate his birth. So guess what? I already know you know who Jesus is. Knowing who Jesus is doesn't get you to be a Christian and won't get you to heaven. The devil knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. He's not a Christian. So head knowledge doesn't get you there. You can't get there by what you have in your head. It's about what you have done with your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Come on, only you know that answer. And if you haven't, here you are tonight in a safe and friendly place. Why, we've laughed, we've had a good time, we've clapped, you've listened to the word, we've sung songs. Man, what a great church service. But it even gets better as you respond by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Notice how I emphasize the word give. You know why I say give? You gotta give it to him because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to go after your heart. It's your call. It's your choice. The question is, will you give God all of your heart? Give God all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven. Or do you think you want to try making it your own way? Because you're not going to make it according to Jesus. You got to give him all of your heart. You got to give him all of your life. That's what he did for you. He gave you all of his heart, gave you all of his life. Here we are in the safe, friendly place. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I give him all of my heart? 
How do I give him all of my life? In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'll pop my hands together. I'll go, bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is this. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to give Jesus all of my heart, give him all of my life, and then put your hand right back down. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you as mine before my father. So when you raise your hand, I'm a man, I'll see it. And he says, I'll confess you as mine before my father. But then he goes on and says, if you deny me before men, sit there like this and stare at me when you know you need to get your hand up. He says, then I will deny you before my father. It's your call. It's your choice. I can't make you do it. You say, Pastor Jim, wait a minute. You want me to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh -huh. You might be. Get over it. Better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this, isn't it, than be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees? Come on. Yep, you might be embarrassed, but today's your day of salvation. And God brought you here for a purpose and a reason, and this is it. It starts it all with tonight, you getting your hand up. Again, if you haven't raised your hand, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you, get ready to put your hand up. If you've been running from God instead of to God, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure if you've really given him all of your heart, not sure if you've really given him all of your life, tonight is your night of salvation. Back in that family room, you're packed back there. I'm talking to you back over there. In the foyer by television, I'm talking to you watching me right now. Down there at the Love Rock Cafe, wherever you're at, that you hear my voice, I'm talking to you. This family room, all across this auditorium, I'm counting to three, pop my hands together, sit there and do nothing. Or get your hand up and go to heaven. Your call, your choice. Are you ready? It, now listen, if you've never given God all of your heart, this is your time. If you're not sure, this is your time. If you've never given him all of your life, this is your time. Come on. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham at a harvest crusade, but you never followed through with all of your heart and life. Tonight's your night to follow through. It's your call. I'm counting. Here it is. One, two, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thank you. There's thirteen. Thank you. There's fourteen back there. There's fifteen. Thank you. On this side, there's fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. There's seventeen back over here. God bless you. Thank you. Where are you? Eighteen. Eighteen. You need to get your hand up. I already counted her. Eighteen. Where are you? Any in that family room? Any in this family room? Eighteen. How many? I can't see you. Raise your hands a little, a little further. Three, okay, 18 and three is 21. 22, thank you. 23, God bless you. Anybody else going for God tonight? Let's go for God together tonight. Just, just, hey, 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 hey. Let's don't miss opportunities. Get out of your rut and let's go for God. Anybody else? 20, how many? 23, there's somebody on this side, they're pointing over here. 23, 24, God, God bless you. Anybody else? There's one on this side somewhere. Is that you? Yep, that's you. 24, 25, go ahead and put your hand down. Anybody else? Any of my pastors want to get saved? <laughs> Joel Alvarado, you need to really get saved, man. 25 people, what do you say? Are you happy? Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Okay, here's what I want you to do. All 25 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Meet me right here in front. No one leave during this period of time. I'll dismiss you in a moment. All 25 of you that raise your hands, anybody that should have raised your hand but you didn't, you can come too. Just check with your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you. All 25 of you, get out of your seat. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Get up here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Knows my name. Come on, come on, come on. He knows my name. Oh, 
of you. That's great. Listen, everybody put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you, you know. In fact, I'll show you how nice everything is. Look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. No weird stuff. He's been voted the nicest pastor in the world. In the world. Can you believe that? Number one nicest pastor in the world. The only one that voted was his wife. But that's pretty good, you know? Pretty good. So he's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart, give you some free stuff, take home and read, encourage you to get back to church, give this church a year of your life. Man, I'm telling you, God will give back to you the rest of your life blessed. And you need to be blessed for a change. I tell you, you need to break. Listen to me. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You need to break those family curses. You need to go on with Jesus. You need life in your future. Give God a chance and he'll do great, mighty, marvelous things. I, I, I don't care who your daddy was. I don't care who your mother was. I know who the king of glory is, and he will take care of your future. But you're going to have to give him, get out of your rut, get out of your routine, and get back to church. Man, we're ha am I talking the truth? We're having a good time at church. Real quick, make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. 